So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Deborah Goodrich Royce to discuss Ruby Falls with us. It has already been named one of the most riveting books of spring 2021 by Veranda Magazine. And tonight we also have Kimberly Bell joining us. Hello, Kimberly. Hi. Hello. I think Deborah is joining us soon. Uh, can you hear me? I'm happy. Yes. So, video settings. All right. How about now? There we go. But I have some very funny thing. How do I get rid of? I've gone. <laughs> I okay. don't know. You, you. How do I undo that? Uh, general. We can I'm having an issue. Okay, I can so see. It's just, just it fine. might just look like this. Hmm. I'm having technical difficulties. Kimberly, can you can you see her? Okay, I can see her. I can I see her. See just her. fine. Peculiar though. Yeah, you have a little green. There is, I wonder if it's um. It's a virtual background. So this has oh, added a whole hard. element of uh, drama. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Zoom. <laughs> no filter. No. Not a cat. All right. So we're just going to go with it. We're just going to. That's gonna fine. I, we're yep. being green. You are a little bit green, but it's, it's just around you. So I think it's, I think it's fine. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so for anybody that doesn't know, um, I will go over a brief bio for both Deborah and Kimberly. Um, so Deborah's first novel, Finding Mrs. Ford, debuted in 2019 to rave reviews. She holds a bachelor's degree in French and Italian from Lake Erie College and an honorary doctorate from the same institution. She is a former actress and story editor at Miramax Films. Ruby Falls is her second psychological thriller, and she owes a debt of gratitude for its inspiration to Daphne du Maurier and Alfred Hitchcock. She divides her time between the Northeast and Florida, where she writes, reads, watches lots of movies, and spends time with her family. She and her husband have restored more buildings than she can count, including the Ocean House Hotel and the Deer Mountain Inn. So welcome, Deborah. <laughs> and Kimberly Bell is the USA Today and internationally best-selling author of six novels, including her domestic suspense, Stranger in the Lake, uh, which was published in June 2020. I will post a link to that in just one moment. And her third novel, The Marriage Lie, was a semi-finalist in the 2017 Goodreads Choice Awards for Best Mystery and Thriller. And it was a number one ebook bestseller in the UK and in Italy. She has sold rights to her books in a dozen languages as well as film and television options. She's a graduate of Agnes Scott College and she divides her time between Atlanta and Amsterdam. So welcome to both of you. Deborah and Kimberly will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes and then we will open it up to those audience questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you. So, look, I'm having special effects. My <laughs> eyes are looking like a horror movie. Hello, I, I can't quite figure out what it is, but here we are. Hi, Kimberly, how are you? I'm so Good to see you. So first fun. of all, congrats, because today is your actual pub day. Like it is hot off the press, right? Day is the day and it's so weird. Uh, so Stranger in the Lake came out in COVID, right? So yeah. even worse COVID, that was last year. So yeah, so this is kind of quasi COVID, um, but it's weird. It's strange and kind of fun, kind of exciting. You know, you get to connect with more people like this, but obviously it's all uh, in all the- virtual, yeah. Yeah, I missed out on it too. I love going out to visit bookstores, don't you? More than anything, yeah. I think there's nothing like actually sitting there and talking to people right. who, because because people start to understand what you're all about and what you're doing and you hear from them and what they respond to. I mean, don't you find that when you write a book and, and you put it out there, other people see things in it that you oh, didn't sure. necessarily. Oh, for sure. And I do a lot of book clubs and book clubs are the best slash the worst about pointing out all these things that I was like, oh gosh, I didn't think about it that way. Um, no, I, I know. 
to that. I know, and I think any work of art, I think a, a painting, a piece of music, a movie, it all, um, you know, definitely goes to yeah. somebody else and it, it comes back to you differently. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Well, we're going to get to um, some lots of questions. So I hope we can have a big discussion going back and forth with um, the folks that are here tonight. But first, why don't you tell us in your words um, about Ruby Falls, what the book is about? Okay, I will do so. I'm so distracted by how green I am. Um, <laughs> so Ruby Falls is, it's a psychological thriller that's also kind of in the meta gothic zone. It plays with gothic themes. And when I talk about gothic, I'm really thinking about Victorian gothic, like uh, Jane Eyre, Woman in White, Rebecca, to which it is very referential, in that, you know, gothic books are really dealing with themes of death and a little bit of horror and romance kind of all mixed in. And there's always, I think, a heroine who has some innocence and there's always a dark male figure who may or may not have her best interests in mind. So like that, the book really does start with all those elements. It begins with a trauma when a little girl at the age of six is abandoned in a cave by her father, a uh, cave by the name of Ruby Falls. Her name is Ruby, so it is a double entendre. We, we know that we're playing with that. And her dad brings her there. This is a cave near Chattanooga, Tennessee. Have you, have you ever been there? My neck of the woods. I was gonna say, I used to go there with my school on school trips. It scared me witless. So my dad uh, grew up in Dixon, Tennessee, which is the other side of the state. But we would always do, I grew up in Michigan, and we would always do the whole um, mountain visit. And there are a million caves around there. So, but Ruby Falls is the absolute scariest to me. So it begins in this cave. And as I remember it, that's how I wrote it. The lights are off pitch black dark. I mean, I suppose now they're not off off that they couldn't do that now. That's how I remember it. So it's pitch black dark. The little girl's in the cave. She's with her father. She can't tell where the waterfalls are falling. And she's terrified she's going to fall in. And a tour guide is saying, you know, and the divers have dived down and they've never been able to find the bottom. And she's just frozen. And her father lets go of her hand. And when the lights come back on, he's gone. And this is needless to say, traumatic. So that's the beginning of the book. And the next chapter is 20 years later, she is an actress. She's gotten rid of the name Ruby, which was her middle name. She goes by Eleanor Russell because she finds it you know, fancier. And she's been written out of, which is a nice way of saying fired from her soap opera. She's, she's an actress on a soap opera and she goes to Europe meets a dashing stranger by the name of Orlando Montague, which is a very gothic name. And she marries him without knowing him. And he's very exotic. He's Anglo-Chinese. And he tells her a whole story of how his parents met in Calcutta when his mother was fleeing China and all that. They go to Rome. They're about to go in the catacombs. She has an attack of claustrophobia, as you can well imagine has to be escorted out, at which point she knows she should tell this brand new husband about this thing that happened to her, but she doesn't. So she starts the marriage with a secret. They go to LA, they perfect cottage, nice little kitty cat. She's cast in a remake of the movie, Rebecca, and things start to go completely off kilter because Orlando starts to act a little strange. And the reader and the heroine both realize about the same time that he has a secret or two of his own. So that's the setup of the book. I loved it. So when you first got the idea, was it because of Rebecca? Was that what, like, what was the very first spark of the idea? That's a good question. So the very first spark came when I was in edits for my first book and it was out well I had finished edits for the first book it was out at publishing houses garnering rejections and the first two chapters downloaded in my brain I was in this house and it the first two chapters just came to me and I thought well 
that's weird. That was not really the book I thought I was going to be writing. I had started notes on another book and I knew I'd been to Ruby Falls. I knew it had scared me. I didn't know. I mean, my parents didn't leave me there, obviously, but um, so then, then I had to structure out a book. Then I really had to figure out where I was going. So in this case, more than some other things, it came first with just a jolt of inspiration and then all the work followed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I loved how the, um, the relative, or not relative, the newness of their relationship like really amplified all these story questions. Um, and, and it was just a really great way to intrigue the reader because um, not only does the reader not know 100% what's going on, but neither does Ruby, right? So like, what, what is it about a marriage that you think makes a great setup for a novel like this one? Says you, who writes so much about marriage and <laughs> the secrets a marriage can contain. You know, I'm a woman of a certain age, so I've lived a little while on this planet, and I've met a lot of people who are not exactly who they seem. Mm -hmm. And I think most people are not 100% who they seem, and mostly that's very benign. It's not such a big deal. We show different faces to different people. But as you well know, this concept of well, okay, so I did uh, a movie with Mark Harmon many years ago about Ted Bundy, mm. and it was called The Deliberate Stranger, and one of the books I read was written by Anne Rule, and it was called The Stranger Beside Me, and that's the setup of something crazy in a marriage where there is this stranger who is right next to you, this person that you're so close to who may not be what he seems, nothing is scarier than that. I 100% agree. I think that's the charm of domestic suspense. You're sleeping literally with someone who could be an enemy. I mean. Right, right. And it, it, is, it is a very contained setup and it is a very effective setup. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, and I, I mean, you have just sent shivers down my spine with your books, with all of that, so. Yeah, it's it 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 just you're in you're you're in right away. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And there's also this like looming idea of betrayal and secrets and lies and all these things, you know, in this person that you're supposed to trust the most. And that um, to me is the scariest thing you can put on on paper, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you think about India, where I guess they still have arranged marriages, and you can kind of see why, in, <laughs> in a way, in kind of this macro sense, why a family would think, why don't you let us handle this, because you probably don't really know what you're doing. Of course, how well do they know, even if you know a family, you don't really know right. every person in it, and what people can, can harbor secrets, and yeah. I just don't find that's most do harbor secrets, I think. Most do. Yeah. Um, so you actually set this story in the past. Ruby Falls was in 1968. And then when they went back to Hollywood, it was, I think, late 80s, correct? That's right. 87. So, yeah. So how come you decided to do that? Was there a reason? Technology. Oh, Technology. <laughs> oh yeah. When she is left in the cave, there are no credit card records. Mm -hmm. There are no camera, there's no camera footage to look at. They have no way of tracking. So the little girl, you know, when the father disappears and she's in this cave and there, there are other tourists and the tour guides look at her and they, they don't think she came in alone. She's six years old. It doesn't make any sense that she would come in alone, but they don't really remember. They weren't paying attention. So that's kind of untrackable. Mm -hmm. And then in the eighties, there are no cell phones. Also uh, my girl, Ruby slash Eleanor descends a part of her, you know, with the disappearance of her father, she is very obsessed with what could have been. And so we would call her maybe a bit of a conspiracy theorist, but it's a very personal level of conspiracy. She's not interested in the big sense of what's going on in the world, but what happened to her father. And because her middle name is Ruby, she, you know, thinks about 
the Kennedy assassination and Jack Ruby and you know maybe her dad was with the CIA and and on and on and on the Dixie Mafia which is real had it been modern era mm -hmm. you can really a conspiracy search can sort of take over a book mm -hmm. it because of, of our technological capacity mm -hmm. so that's really the reason right right technology makes it easier in a lot of ways to write these kind of stories but it also can make it harder so yeah i thought that was fascinating right because you've got to account for all of it um in my first book the half of the book is in 2014 so there is very much technology and something has to be done about that at a, at a certain point in the book um you have to figure out what to do with it yeah yes yeah, yeah. So um, I think it was on here. I saw, oh yeah, Sandra Brown called it, um, Ruby Falls is what a reader wants a psychological thriller to be. And it is, there is a big element of psychological suspense thriller um, in it um, because, you know, like you said, Ruby's been left. She has this trauma from when she was six and it, it really influences who she becomes and how she lives her life. But so and and psychological suspense of course is a big genre these days and very popular but why do you think readers love these deep dives into um a psychological mind well i think people like puzzles of all kinds i think whether you like jigsaw puzzles or crossword puzzles um i look at these as identity puzzles and that's how i think of it you're you're kind of picking apart what is really going on and i got a really terrific edit from my editor on this uh, and she said ra rather than thinking about agatha christie who when you know well that's a particular setup it's a bunch of people in an isolated setting often where people are disappearing but with agatha christie you often have a detective come in at the end and kind of wrap everything off up in a way that you could never have put together. Mm. So what this editor said to me, she said, think about the sixth sense, the movie. And when it gets to the point where you understand what's really going on with the heroine, even if the reader didn't figure it out, you want the reader to have that moment of looking back saying, oh, I could have, ah, yeah. there's a clue, there's a clue, there's a clue. So that to me was an extremely helpful edit. Mm -hmm. And I tweaked a couple of things that I do think serve that purpose in this book because the twist is such an extreme twist. Mm -hmm. um, you, don't, you don't want people to get to the end of a, a, a book like this and say something like, and then they were all hit by a bus. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's cheating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so that... So the psychological component, because we're really looking at, you know, these intimate relationships wow. and the thought process of a particular character, uh, that's how all of that comes in. Yeah. So speaking of twists, do you know yours going in when you sit down to write? Do you have the whole story mapped out and you know what the big twist is going to be or the twists? Um, or do you, they come as you're writing them? Both both like i have an idea with my first book the major twist comes in the middle of the book in finding mrs ford and i very soon into charting it out i knew i wanted that to happen but i thought that was going to be the end of the book and it mm -hmm. ended up being the middle of the book because there was a different way of looking at it all uh with this book no I went a long way with looking at all the things it could be. And then I chose a particular thing it could be because it was the only thing that really at the end of the day made sense to me. And I didn't come to it fast. Mm -hmm. And it ends in a whirlwind and some readers like it and some don't. Um, and sometimes when something ends quickly, the way I ended this, there are people who think, well, did you just stop writing? Well, no, actually, no. you don't just stop writing. Look at my teeth are green when I smile. You don't just stop writing. I mean, it takes a long while to kind of suss out 
yeah. how that's going to twist. But mm -hmm. and then it just was the only thing that worked for me. Doesn't that scare you though, as you're writing, like you're right? Cause I mean, I don't know your book, this is at least 80,000 words, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, that takes you how long to do months and months and months and months. And you, you know, you're, you're writing this book and doesn't that scare you? If you think, I don't know exactly how it's going to end and if it's going to work out and it does. Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm, wrapping up a first draft on another book right now. And it's a weird book because there are two very disparate things going on. There's a writer who's obsessed with the murder of her mother's best friend, who's writing a story of a thriller that's noirish, that's kind of going along and it goes back and forth. And I don't actually know yet if those two rhythms work together because they're very different rhythms and, you know, Pacing in a book is extremely important, particularly a thriller. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is just too oddly meditative for every other chapter or, but I'm going to write it and see. So, yeah, and I think, I think we have to also trust that um, our brains, even when we're, we're not a hundred percent there with the story that our brains meanwhile are working maybe offline and um, and and things will come together the way that they're supposed to. Don't you have that with every story like this moment where it like. All the time. And I think it often happens when I'm away from my desk. Mm -hmm. It often happens when I'm sleeping or walking or brushing my teeth or doing something where I feel like I'm not even thinking about it. And then then the idea will come and the resolution to something, uh, the, the fixing of something. And I think that's the reason why we generally don't write books in a few weeks. Maybe some people do, but I think it, it's not just the time you're writing. There's the factor of all that other percolating time. Right. Yeah. Right. Because it's not just about the words that you're spitting out onto your, your computer screen. It's really about like figuring out who these characters are, what they're doing in this story, right? And just, and thinking through all the moving parts of a story to make it one whole. Absolutely. Yeah. So how long does it take you to write a book typically, a first draft? About a year. I'm slow. Yeah. About a year for a first draft. And then the ed editing process, you know, Finding Mrs. Ford and Ruby Falls overlapped. So it, each of them ended up being more than that, like four years, but it wasn't straight through working. Mm -hmm. um, how about you? I mean, I always said it was usually about a six to eight month mm -hmm. you know, thing for me. And then last year I wrote the book that's coming out in December, My Darling Husband. I wrote it in four months, which is the fastest I've ever written a book, but it was because I was going nowhere and seeing no one. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, I mean, the pandemic was good for my writing. Um, I'm not sure that I can keep that up in the future, though. No, I had the same experience. So this one I worked on for me was 10 months to my usual, more like a year. And it definitely it was pandemic related. Uh -huh. So, yeah. no, and I don't think we will. I often I ask people what do you want to keep in your life from the pandemic? I mean, obviously not illness and devastation, but I think there are elements of life I would like to hold on to somewhat from that period. Yeah, for sure. And letting go of a lot of things that were eating up my time is one of them. Um, but I'm not sure I want to write a book in four months again. That's intense. Yeah. I mean, it, it flew out of me, but I think it was because I was searching for, you know, um, distraction and, um, uh, somewhere else for my mind to go. It was early in the pandemic and it was, you know, we were all kind of losing our minds. That was a crazy time because you think about it, it is very easy to recharacterize it now from the vantage point of our understanding now. 
but there was no understanding in that moment how long it would go on and how grave it would become. Right, right. It was super scary. And so I was looking for something else to, to for my mind to do. So it worked out well. Um, I want to go back to Ruby because um, she has found fame as an actress on a soap opera, which is kind of, you know, a, a nod to your past. I mean, I guess that you did that on purpose. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I, um, someone asked me, did I want to set the whole thing in a soap opera? And I didn't think that had enough currency in the modern age because soap operas are nearly gone. There are really only three left. General Hospital, uh, The Bold and the Beautiful and maybe the young and the restless, but I was on all my children. And so, yeah, I actually played with that. I made her, Eleanor, be the sister of the star, who is Sylvia Long, who is not at all based on Susan Lucci. Uh, and, but yeah, I, I wanted to, I love little winks. You know, I name the chapters after movies. the world turns. Yeah, yeah, I just, that kind of stuff, it's part of the puzzle and part of the fun for me. And if people don't know what the titles of the chapters refer to, it does not matter. It doesn't ruin the story of the book. But if you like that sort of thing, you know, it's like a little breadcrumb trail. I loved it. And, you know, I think it's really smart because I think, you know, for normal everyday people like me, I'm fascinated by that stuff. I mean, I was eating it up when I heard actress and soap opera in Hollywood Hills. I was 100 percent in. Yeah. And I I mean, that's one thing like so I was going back to L.A. and visiting my daughter and kind of charting out, you know, when I write a place, I like to make sure that if I say something is a certain distance, it really is about that. And, you know, that people can say, oh, I've been there. I know that that, you know, the the gates of Paramount or the Hollywood sign, they're really iconic places. So yeah. I enjoyed writing that. Yeah. I also loved um, at the agent. Was that Howard? Yeah. So um, if you look at the dedication of my book, I dedicate this to four people. And they are four friends who died. And they are four friends with whom I was very close in that period. And one of them was Howard Goldberg, my agent, who died in the early years of um, the HIV AIDS epidemic. Well, he died in the early 90s, so he didn't die in the really early part of it, but he was just an extraordinary human being. And so there are just, so I started going back to Los Angeles in recent years when my daughter moved there and I hadn't been there in a long time. And place is funny, you know, if you, if you live your life in one place and obviously you have the whole range of good and bad things that happen, but, you know, that corner, that building, that movie theater, it maybe doesn't kind of tear you apart every time you see it because you drive by it all the time. Like I've lived where I live now for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So every time I drive around the corner, I don't think of everything that's ever happened on that corner. So I was apart from LA for a long time, 15 years. And going back, it was emotionally overwhelming because uh, you know, I, these four friends I dedicate the book to, they are all dead and they died young. So I would have this emotional experience driving around of remembering my friend Lisa or Anna or Howard or Grant. So maybe that played into the writing of this book because yeah. it has a sad quality too. Um, anyway, so Howard's based on a real person. Well, and he felt really real to me. And I love the way that he doted on, on her and how he just was, I mean, he felt like he, you know, a, a, a true um, person on her side, no matter what she was going through. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you got that from him. That makes me happy. <laughs> So um, I once read a Guardian article about how um, authors, most of us actually hear our characters talking in our heads and like speech patterns, accents, the whole thing. Are you one of those authors or am I the crazy one here? <laughs> totally. Absolutely. And I often read parts of the book aloud uh -huh. and I picture the accents. I tend to write men with accents. 
-hmm. I have a, an Iraqi Chaldean man in my first book. I've got this Anglo Chinese man. Mm -hmm. I have an Argentine man in my third book. So I don't know, I guess I like that tall, dark and handsome man. But I do hear the voices and I do think about actors that I could imagine. And so hearing the audiobook is always interesting. And that's part of letting your book go and yeah. letting someone else interpret it. But absolutely, I do. Yeah. And do you have um, a lot of say in who they choose or are you kind of at the mercy of your publisher? I have been able to put in suggestions and I've liked, so I've only written two books so far and they're published too. I, I've liked the actresses because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're not using multiple actors for my books. They're using one and I've really loved both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And I'd imagine that, you know, I mean, you know, a lot more than I do. So I, I would imagine that you have, um, you could be a little more opinionated than me and, and um, when it comes to choosing an actor or actress for your book, because I, I'm like, I don't know, just choose somebody who's good. I don't, I don't, it's hard for me to oh. say that one is better because. Well, uh, so uh, the actress Saskia Marleveld re read uh, Finding Mrs. Ford and she has a really sexy whiskey throated voice, which I just find. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. I love that. And I wanted a younger voice for Ruby Falls because Eleanor is a much more tentative person, a younger person. And uh, Stephanie Wells read it. And uh, I think she does a great job. I've only ever heard a little excerpt so far. I haven't heard the whole book, but. I always think that's scary to like sit down and listen to your book. I've never listened to one of mine all the way through. No. Yeah, it is scary. It's like watching yourself in a movie, which is so hard to do. I finally know what my voice sounds like. But when I was a young actress, my voice shocked and appalled me. Just just startled me. I actually could not believe that was my voice. <laughs> it's, anyway, uh, but I'm used to it now. So yeah, it's just... That's funny. Um, let's see. It's... Uh... 6.35, do we want to do some sure. questions? I see a bunch of, uh... hi. Hello. Yes, we have had quite a few questions come in. come in. We can dive into a few of those. I don't know if we're gonna get to all of them, but we will do our best. Um, so Charlene, oh wait, before we get started, um, I did just wanna mention, we did have, um, as part of tonight's event, we did have a drawing for a free, a free tote bag. Um, which is promoting Ruby Falls. It has the, the book cover, the gorgeous book cover um, on it. And we already drew the winner. So Catherine P, um, if you're watching tonight, congratulations, you've won a free okay, tote bag. <laughs> we can always use more of those. Um, and we will reach out to you tomorrow for your details to get, um, to get that sent out, sent out to you or um, feel free to pick it up in store too. So we'll reach out to you, Catherine, tomorrow. Okay, now let's dive into some of those questions. Um, so Charlene said, this is such a great question. I, I, we've not had this one before. She said, congratulations on your books. Did you ever consider using a pen name? And if so, what would it be? Kimberly, do you want to take that one? Right under a pen name. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's not because I chose it. But um, my last name, my husband is Dutch, which is why I go back and forth so much to Amsterdam. Um, and my last name is just one of those crazy Dutch spellings. And my publisher, when I signed with them, they said, we love your books. We don't love your name so much. And at first I was kind of a little insulted, but it's because of discoverability, right? If a reader hears Kimberly Bell, they know exactly how to spell maybe with E, without an E, but they could find me, but with my Dutch name, they couldn't. So that's why. Got it. Right. So for me, I acted as Deborah Goodrich. <clears throat> In my first marriage, I was Deborah Porter. My second marriage, I'm Deborah Royce. So the name thing is rather important to me. So Deborah Royce is very easy to say, but I wanted to put the Goodrich back into 
kind of reconnect the pieces of myself and the pieces of my life together. And um, so that's why I use three names, but they're all names I came by <laughs> in one way or another. <laughs> awesome. Um, so Sherry would like to know, uh, so you both write psychological thrillers. How do you separate that from real life? Do you ever struggle to separate that from real life? You go, Deborah. Okay, no, I don't. I really don't. I sit for long periods at the table writing and then I get up and it's always kind of percolating, but not in an intrusive way and in kind of a fun way, like a little idea flicker. The only time I've had it like really interfere, I have the same, you know, I mean, it's hard when you're writing a story to stop writing because you have to get to 90,000 words and we've talked about how long that takes us. So you're never done, right? With a story at the end of the day, you close your laptop and you're not done. Um, but the only time that it really kind of uh, got to me was when I was writing The Marriage Lie and anytime I would get on a plane because that book is about a plane crash, basically. Mm -hmm. a husband who dies in a plane crash. And mm -hmm. so I took a lot of Xanax <laughs> when I flew that year, mm -hmm. but I'm good now. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Cause I, I mean, I imagine as you're writing, like you, I mean, you know, you, you really immerse yourself in what your characters are going through. So in a lot of ways, you're feeling a lot of the same things. And right. And I did a lot of research around why planes crash and that's not oh. a good <laughs> Don't do that. Not recommend that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Um, so Laurie has asked if both of you could share some of your favorite Gothic authors and novels. Well, I think The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins is a phenomenal, spooky, Gothic, long, you know, the, everything was very long. Uh, Love Jane Eyre, love Rebecca. What are some others that I really loved? I'd say those are the three, uh, Wuthering Heights. Those are in the, the top for me. Yeah, I agree, especially with those last two. I'm, I'm thinking like more recent Gothic. So Emily Carpenter is one she writes um, and they're all set here in the South southern gothic um novels suspenseful novels um what's the one uh the the woman upstairs was it the woman upstairs it just came out uh is that the spin off of jane eyre about it, the ooh, yes yeah yes, yes. i think it's is it rachel there? hawkins i think she's she's from alabama yep i think it's the wife upstairs the wife yep. upstairs. rachel hawkins the wife upstairs yep. Yep, yep. Thank so you for that recommendation. Those are good ones. Okay. And it, could you talk a little bit more about that that word gothic? I know Deborah, when you came into Savoy the other day, we we were talking about that kind of that categorization a little bit. Um, what what makes a novel kind of a gothic novel? Do you consider Ruby Falls to be a gothic novel? What what draws you to that? So I do, but it it isn't in you know. For the readers of things like Twilight, it's not quite as supernatural. Uh, I don't, it, it, it is more that setup of, if you can call it a damsel in distress, uh, a young woman in a situation with uh, a, a man who's clearly more powerful in some ways who, you know, may or may not be a malevolent force. So she is vulnerable, she is at risk. Uh, there's an element of danger there. And there's a, there's a romanticism and uh, it can sort of verge on horror sometimes if you think about um, some of them, but not fully in that direction. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think I said that too in uh, the blurb because I blurb, I read this book like I think last year, right? And I said something about how it had serious Gothic vibes. And I think it was all those things that you said, but I think there was something also in the voice of the novel, the 
the way you told the story and 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 Ruby slash Eleanor's voice was just it gave me gothic vibes. Mm, good. That, that that was my intention. Good. Yay. <laughs> So kind of in that same, um, same theme, Nancy is curious, Nancy from Chicago is curious if you've ever thought of um, going a different direction with a book that's not, not kind of a Gothic novel, but more, she says, um, have you ever thought of, of, I think she meant maybe writing a book with a different theme, such as a plain love story, no strange occurrences. So maybe, oh. maybe switching genres there. Oh, I'll, I'll take that. So not all my books are gothic. This is the only one that's gothic. They are all psychological thrillers. I mean, the first book is very Hitchcockian. This is gothic. And the third book veers toward noir. Um, but without secrets and lies, huh? I don't know. <laughs> what about you, Kimberly? I don't know. I mean, I never say never, but you know, I wrote, my first two books kind of straddled the line with women's fiction. There was some romance in it, um, but they were still at the core suspense plots. So um, I don't know. I think romance is really hard to write, really hard to write. I have some author friends who write romance and they do it so well. And I'm like, I don't know how you do it. I mean, you really, you really have to get in their heads in a, in a way that you like it's easier with, I think, plot comes to me first. So maybe that's why I choose to write these kinds of stories. Um, Character is harder for me. Right. Yeah, Deborah, what about you? Does, it, does plot come first or characters or a specific scene? So with the third book, I started in the pandemic and I didn't have the plot. So what I started was the part of the book. So there's the writer who's, a, did I talk about it? I'm not sure if I talked mm -hmm. about it. So the writer's obsessing about the murder of her mother's best friend. My mother's best friend was murdered in Pittsburgh at age 12, unsolved crime. So I started by doing a lot of research on the murder of my mother's friend. And I started writing kind of these musing chapters from the writer's point of view and then the plot started to come for the story that the writer was writing and how it was all gonna intersect. So I think what I did then in that case is I just kept moving forward if, when I didn't have the plot yet, and then it came. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's see, where is it? Oh, okay. So I thought, I thought this was a great question too. Um, Charlene, also asked, have you written the book that you've always wanted to write or do you feel like it's still to come? Kimberly? Um, I, I hope it's still to come <laughs> because I think that's also what kind of keeps me going. I mean, every, every time I sit down to write a story, I, you know, I, I, I love, I write it because I love it. Right. And, um, and I hope it's going to, um, that readers are going to feel the same way about the characters in the story that I do, but I do feel like there's a story in me that I can't quite put my finger on that is still waiting to be told. And I'm not quite there with it yet. I love that answer. I think each book I've written of the three, each has a piece of that story I have needed to tell. And I don't feel like I'm finished with the pieces yet. And is there going to be one that kind of is the cohesive one? I don't know. I, I love that answer, Deborah. that kind of each one of your books has a part of it that kind of feels like it, it feeds into that. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's a really great way of putting it. Um, Janice has asked, and this is kind of a broad question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment? Hmm. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big one. It's a big question to ask. <laughs> so I think 
the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was raising children. And I have wonderful children and hardest in that it kind of pulled everything from me and took me out of myself a little bit. And it, so I do feel that that was a huge accomplishment because I think it is the most intensive and concentrated and meaningful thing I ever could do. And that is why I'm, you know, as a woman of a certain age here, I'm kind of a later author because my writing in those years was much more back burner. I was writing, but it was much quieter and I never could really put the time together to write a novel. Um, so I'm gonna say that, raising children. Are we the same person? Because I have the exact same answer. <laughs> it's really true. And I actually got a late start at writing. This is really my second career. I was in fundraising not for nonprofits forever. And, um, and then once my kids got to be a little older and we got to a place where I didn't really, because, you know, I mean, it takes, it takes many years before you earn a penny so all that time, you know, I'm writing, 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 and nobody's paying me. So we had to get, be at a point where I could afford to do that. And the kids were older, so I had a little more time and attention. And, um, but yeah, I 100% I agree, kids, and um, I wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. I feel that way too. I wouldn't change it. I feel that I have more to say than I had when I was younger. And that I'm not saying that that's true of any other person besides me. Uh, I can't speak for anybody else, but I just, stories come more freely to me now than they did when I was younger. I could always write a sentence and a paragraph, but I didn't have a wealth of story ideas. And that came later for me. Interesting. Good answers. Um, okay, I think we're going to do two more questions here before we wrap up. Um, so some people are interested in hearing about the cover. Um, I think specifically Ruby Falls, it's such a striking cover. Um, the girl is just beautiful. And um, it's a great story. Um, yeah. There are two parts to how that cover came about. One, I was working with the artist and graphic designer I'd worked with on Finding Mrs. Ford, and we had a different cover that we were working on, which was more floral based because the first book was floral. And what we ended up fiddling with was a little close to another artist's work. Uh, and it just got into an uncomfortable zone. And this photograph, oh God, you can't see anything. It's all green. Um, <laughs> This wonderful photograph, it's going to let, you can't see anything I have. Here, I'll hold it up. Uh, this is like Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> There's a photographer called Melanie Wilhide. And she was doing a show in Los Angeles. And all of her work, her entire body of work for this show was on her computer, which was stolen. And it was gone for three weeks. And when the police retrieved her computer and she tried to get her work off of it. The thief had tried to swipe it. So everything came out looking like I look now. It was all kind of chopped and in strips. And so she ended up creating her show based on that. And she dedicated the show to the thief. Her show was called To Adrian Rodriguez with Love. And this Whoa. photograph which is called Grace and Thorns, was a photograph made after the theft, but based on this accidental discovery from, from the thievery. So I just think, you know, I have a, my heroine is a character who's trying very hard to keep it together and not doing very well. And this cover, I think, indicates, I think it's very gothic and it's very beautiful, but it's odd if you look at it closely yeah. like things are coming in all different angles that's yeah. the story of it I love it that is one of the most interesting cover stories I think I've heard that is really cool <laughs> what was and what's the name of the um the artist that designed it Melanie Wilhide W-I-L-L-H-I-D-E 
Okay. It's represented okay. by a gallery called Von Lintel, I think. Okay. V O N L I N T E L. Well, and she's extraordinary. Like we yeah. have met. Um, I ended up buying a, a larger print of the photograph that's hanging mm. in my house. I just, the photograph. So, in that case, I think that photograph was meant to be the cover of this book, and it just took a couple twists and turns for it to get there. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out beautifully. Um, and one final question that I always like to end with, it's a good one to wrap up with, is just to ask both of you, what is, what's on your nightstand right now? What are you reading? Kimberly? Um, well, I have a couple of books that I'm reading to potentially blurb, um, and I couldn't tell you their names without actually going and looking at them. Um, but what I'm reading for pleasure right now is um, the third Carolyn Kepnes you book what is it called you love me maybe um it's part three of her of her joe series have you okay. read or seen those they're on now yeah. oh year. okay yeah and i i'm reading uh because i love a good identity thriller who is maude dixon oh that was so good yeah. I loved it. don't tell me I I'm, I'm, <laughs> and that is an identity piece very much Great. Well, this has been such a fun conversation. Um, thank you both, Deborah and Kimberly, for being with us tonight. And thank you so much to everybody watching. Um, I did just pop links into the chat for Ruby Falls and Finding Mrs. Ford. Um, and here is a link to Stranger in the Lake. Um, I believe the mass market paperback is coming out later this summer. Is it, was it June or July? Uh, the end of June. Great. So keep an eye out for that. And of course, we are always looking forward to seeing what you both come up with next. So thank you so much thank for joining us tonight. And I'm going to find technical support so that <laughs> I'm not I'm green. A little, a little green. <laughs> Fine. Bye. It's, it's thank, you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye. Have a great night. You too.